to uh... All right, so welcome. Um, this is the Horasis live stream for our session today on longing for perpetual motion, energy costing nothing. And um, I welcome those who are online or who will be joining us as we get started today. And I really am grateful for the roundup of speakers we have today. Um, I'm gonna do some brief remarks to kind of introduce things and then allow our panelists to introduce themselves and their perspective on this topic of uh, the sort of longing for perpetual motion and the idea of energy costing nothing. Uh, I think that our discussion today is really timely. And I know that there's probably at least one of our speakers who won't be able to join us today in light of his role with the International Trade and Investment Center in the Netherlands. Um, I myself have also been involved in the response to the crisis in Ukraine and the deliberate targeting of energy infrastructure in the country in a way to terrorize and control people. And it just speaks to the, the importance of the topics and the transition in energy systems being something that is about much more than just um, how we turn on our cell phones and power our TVs, but they really have huge social consequences. And with the conversation around climate change and awareness of how the energy sector plays such a, a significant role in impacting our environment and our climate, we recognize that the need for better forms of low or zero carbon emission energy sources is very important. When we think about energy production, not only as electricity, but also the energy we need from solid fuels, liquid fuels for transportation and aviation and shipping. So we think about energy when we talk in this conversation today about not just electricity production, but when we think about electrifying everything and having electric vehicles and swapping gasoline for electrons, it's gonna require a really big rethinking of how we organize energy systems. And I am, you know, graced today with really wonderful selection of energy companies and investors, folks that have been active on these topics globally to help us sort of break down this issue of energy and how do we transform the system? What are our values and goals in terms of what we want to get out of energy systems moving forward? And um, and so I welcome everybody and would like to kind of start off with some introductions with our panelists. Um, we have today um, Jose Martinez, who's the chief executive from APEX, um, as well as Paul Browning, who's joining us from the US, and Ananda Seto Ivanato, who we will refer to as Ivan today um, in his sure. introduction. And he's calling us, I believe, from Indonesia or Tokyo today. So we've got a nice really great, robust roundup. Um, I myself am based in Switzerland outside of Zurich and um, uh, obviously an American, if you recognize my accent and uh, have been working on energy issues myself around the world and largely in stakeholder involvement issues. And so I'll share some of my experiences. Um, Jose, would you like to just spend a couple minutes introducing yourself and your perspective on our topic today? Yeah, thank you, Laura. Um, we, let's say, we have a view uh, from ADEX uh, about the energy in terms of a multi-source, uh, um, multi-source, and uh, the point of the energy is very related with the time to deliver a new uh, power uh, facility. Uh, it, we have to be aware that delivering a new wind farm or a new thermal power plant could take something between five or 10 years, depending on the permissions, the validations and the construction itself. So if we want to do something or we want to have a new megawatt hour tomorrow that uh, required a decision five or 10 years ago. So if we, ha if we want to have a uh, different or new megawatt hour in five or ten years, we have to make the decision today. So I think relate, uh, regarding uh, electricity, the time is an important variable. 
sometimes even more important than the cost or, or the or the effort to deliver um, an, a specific technology. So that's an important thing. And the second the second comment I would like to make to start uh, the debate is um, it's going to be very difficult to get rid of uh, thermal power. So we need to find the best way mm, to enable the coexistence between different sources. And in some countries or region, we'll be using more renewables or more wind or more solar, and in others, uh, more nuclear or in others, more coal. But uh, we have to find a way to adapt to the different situations in any country and any society uh, to deliver the cheapest or the cheapest possible uh, electricity. And we are seeing in Ukraine that, um, uh, let's say, the problem with a nuclear plant could, signif could, could mean that 25% of the electricity is not available in the country. Or we saw in Texas last winter how a problem could uh, drop uh, the whole network and increase the price drastically. So um, it, is, it is important to understand um, this multi-source uh, mix that we'll have in the future. Great. Thanks, Jose. I appreciate the, the importance of time to market. I think something a lot of people don't necessarily recognize about how long it takes once a decision is made before something gets built in the energy sector. Um, uh, Paul, would you like to kind of help set this up for, from your perspective as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm uh, really happy to be on this panel. I've actually spent a lot of time recently thinking about this idea of energy that costs nothing. And so when I saw the, the title of this panel, I was really sort of intrigued because it, it sort of gave me uh, a, an impetus to put some thoughts together that I had sort of rattling around in my head. But, you know, <clears throat> I spent a lot of my career in the power sector and there's something coming to the energy sector at, at large that I don't think a lot of people really uh, may not anticipate. You know, in the, in the power sector, um, in competitive power markets, uh, renewables is just a game changer. And, and the reason is that the variable cost of renewable power is essentially zero. And the way that power gets dispatched uh, once it's been installed is according to variable cost. So if you have a variable cost of zero, you know, you're always, you're always dispatched. And, and, you know, when, when that, when the renewables on your power grid is 2% or 5% or 10%, it's not that big of a deal, but when it gets to be 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 50%, 50%, and, and you're a, a fossil fuel generator that has a very high variable cost of uh, generation, um, you get pushed out of the dispatch curve, and um, and particularly if you're not a flexible source of power generation, um, and you can't come on, you know, to sort of take advantage of higher cost times and then turn down when the cost when the pricing is is so low, uh, you get pushed out of the market. And and what we've been seeing in competitive power markets in the United States um, is that we're coal-fired power plants retiring, nuclear power plants are retiring. The reason is. You know, they were designed to be energy producers. They're supposed to run all the time via very low cost of energy. And they're being displaced by not only zero variable cost renewables, but also uh, very inexpensive natural gas in the U.S., which has a very low variable cost because the cost of natural gas is low. Um, but even natural gas is destined to be pushed out of the dispatch stack as we put more and more renewable power on the grid with, uh, you know, because it's hard to beat zero as a variable cost. Now, why I say this is this thing in the power sector is important to the entire energy sector is we're moving into a time in our world where, as you said, uh, when you introduced this, we're going to be electrifying everything. And, um, and, and electrifying everything doesn't mean everything will be powered by electricity. Uh, what it means is some things are going to be powered by fuels that are made from electricity. Um, and, you know, my company, Fortescue Future Industries, um, that's what we do. We make green hydrogen, which is really just stored renewable power. So we, we take 
renewable power, um, electrolysis and water, and we convert um, renewable power into hydrogen. We store that hydrogen and then uh, we make it available. And it's, it's, it's essentially an energy carrier. It's renewable power stored in the form of hydrogen. And, and so the way we're gonna electrify heavy industry, uh, steel making, uh, a, a lot of other things that you can't directly electrify is with um, green hydrogen and some of its derivatives. And green hydrogen has a variable cost of zero. Now, you know, we're all aware that there's, uh, you know, electrolysis is expensive now. And, you know, there's other things that make the levelized cost of hydrogen pretty high right now. But once you've installed it and built it, its variable cost of production is zero. And so <clears throat> that's important because even in, um, in markets that don't have dispatch curves, the way that pricing is set, in, an, in a global commodity is by the variable cost of the marginal producer. And as you get more and more and more energy that's that's being um, on, that's on the market as a, as a zero variable cost form of, elect, of power, uh, the fossil fuels are gonna get pushed out of, you know, the equivalent of the energy dispatch stack. And it's gonna, and, and the bottom line is if you're in, if you're in fossil fuels, you're, you're gonna be um, sort of on the losing end of uh you know change cycle where uh you know i've always my whole career i've always told businesses that i'm the leader from that you know we want to be uh we want to position ourselves to be the beneficiaries of change not the victims of change mm -hmm. and um as we as we put more and more zero variable cost energy into our system uh if if your if your variable cost is high because you're in one of your primary inputs is a fossil fuel you're going to get pushed out of that uh, dispatch stack and you're going to be on the, the wrong side of change. Maybe I'll just pause there and you know, let the other speakers speak. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a wonderful um, overview. I, I think, Paul, you did a great job introducing concepts like dispatch and versus the installed base, dispatchable power versus installed base and flexible sources. And I, I think there's, so much education around how the grid operates and what the relationship is between power producers and distributors and the transmission for things that are further away. This is just such a, a, a complex industry to really be able to break down solution sets and, and help introduce people to what some of the, the options are. Um, Ivan, would you please yes. introduce yourself and offer some context? I apologize if I look like I'm typing. I'm trying to get one of our last speakers back into the speaker room here. Right, right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and it's a great honor, a pleasure to be here uh, uh, and also uh, speaking together with all the distinguished speakers in this panel today. Uh, yes, I'm Ivan uh, from, uh, or Ivan from Ewing Group. Uh, so I'm Indonesian, uh, but I'm speaking from Tokyo, Japan, uh, because we are actually a uh, a group company where we uh, originated uh, from Japan, uh, but we are working with uh, local uh, partners in Indonesia and Bangladesh to operate in these two countries, and I'm the local partner of the group in Indonesia. And uh, we have been trying very hard to uh, decarbonize uh, the energy uh, sector in Indonesia for the past uh, 12 years, and uh, we hope that we can become one of the uh, contributors for the carbon emission reduction in Indonesia with uh, by deploying as much as possible investments uh, in renewable energy in Indonesia uh, to achieve the uh, net zero carbon emission goals in Indonesia in 2060. In 2060, hopefully it can be sooner uh, and hopefully we can achieve the 23% uh, uh, renewable energy in Indonesia uh, in the next, uh, uh, in 2025. Uh, although I think it's a very, it's gonna be very a very difficult goal because now we only achieve like what 11% so far. So, um, so we need more and more people to help Indonesia to decarbonize. Uh, and other than that, we also have some activities related to waste management, uh, healthcare, and also food securities. Uh, but in this, con but in the context of our discussion today, I would like to bring the hard realities uh, that we are facing now in Indonesia. And we are very happy. Uh, in, uh, although in that kind of situation, we have uh, players, uh, including uh, actually. Uh, 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 Fortescue, uh, who is you know uh, driving you know really uh, significantly to, to to decarbonize. So I, I really hope that uh, you know companies like uh, Fortescue also can uh, you know uh, bring more and more effort to decarbonize the energy sector in Indonesia. So basically, um, 
there was a really heavy blend between how the energy sector grows uh, with the political um, fabrics in Indonesia. Uh, and that's what really drives the policies where in the end, uh, fossil fuels uh, is, is is becoming uh, so abundant uh, and so heavily utilized in Indonesia uh, because uh, basically who's behind the politics and all that are the peoples who are involved in this uh, fossil energy sector, right? But we see, of course, things are changing uh, over the time uh, uh, because of, of course, the climate change issues and, and how p- stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, uh, driving up these issues in COP, the COP meetings and all that. Uh, but the thing is, the hard reality that we, that we have right now in Indonesian context is that we had a bad planning, right? Uh, and what is the result of that bad planning? Now, uh, just to give you um, an, an uh, uh, you know a comparison, uh, Indonesia is a country where we have almost 300 million uh, population, and it grows uh, three million uh, every year. And one of the biggest island in Indonesia called Java, it, it, we, it, the size is 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 a one hundred uh, is a hundredth of Russia, uh, 100, 145 million uh, million population. But we be but we have uh, uh, now oversupply of coal for power plant uh, right now. Uh, is, uh, we have oversupply of fossil fuels uh, about uh, five gigawatt, and seventy percent of that is coming from the coal fired power plant. So, and at the same time, we have this ambitious goal to decarbonize ourselves. So, mm-hmm. so, so the question is how actually we can sort of decarbonize this oversupply of the fossil fuel that we have right now, right? So I think this is, uh, and I believe that, of course, in the, econ- in, in the simple economic theory, if things are so abundant, then it should be able to, you know, reach the cost where it's basically going to be so affordable, right? Uh, so uh, I, I think the question is how, uh, so now the question is actually how we can overcome the situation that we have right now. Uh, and, 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 and storage is becoming one of the uh, big issues, uh, uh, big uh, uh, debate or uh, big discussion that we have right now uh, when it comes to how we can overcome this situation. But uh, storage, is, storage is one thing, but the thing is how we can able to decarbonize uh, ourselves from the over, over uh, abundance of the coal fire uh, uh, supply. Uh, so so that's why I think uh, 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 we, we, we can talk about always these fancy goals of uh, net zero carbon emission and also, uh, you know, energy mix for renewable energy, blah, blah, blah. But we also need to be, uh, uh, we need to be uh, direct with the hard realities that we are facing right now. And I think this is something that the politicians and the government officials need to, you know, face the, uh, need, need to be, uh, uh, what do you call it? They need to be more realistic with the uh, situation that we have right now and come up with practical solutions, right? Sometimes we talk about, okay, we want to co-fire the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, biomass, uh, with biomass uh, fuels for the coal-fired power plant. But the thing is, they don't want to add additional incentive for making the biomass to become economically uh, uh, acceptable for the investors uh, to come in and jump into this co-firing sector. So, you know, so yeah, so that's why this is the hard realities that we are facing right now. So I hope through discussion like this, we can bring more and more people to, to, to you know so that we can find some solution uh, so we can you know come up from this uh, uh, situation that we're having now so I just stop that and maybe we can have discussion um. mm-hmm. yeah I mean I think this um, this reality of the the oversupply of fossil fuel is an important one um, I, I'd like to hear from our panelists in terms of your perspective of the how how real is our commitment to moving away from fossil fuels? And do we have to eliminate the use of fossil fuels? Is that our goal? Or do we need to eliminate carbon emissions? What what do you think? Where what are the real options when we talk about decarbonization? <clears throat> well, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll go. Everyone will get a chance to answer. Yeah, sure, sure. yeah. Uh, let's say to, to, to give a short answer to your questions, in my humble opinion, <clears throat> and you can read a lot of reports even from the IPCC and so on, uh, it's not going to be feasible to get rid of 100% fossil fuels. That's my opinion. We could be 90, we could be 80, we could be 70% uh, of electricity mix without fossil fuels. But 
having 100% uh, electricity mix without fossil fuels, it's going to be nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. And if you uh, see the, the, the mix in Indonesia or in many countries, we are talking that right now the percentage is very low. So we are far away from that 100%. And it's going to take us a lot of years, a lot of years in a very, um, uh, let's say, a positive or optimistic scenario to achieve them. And I'm not saying I'm happy with that situation. I would prefer to have 100% of electricity mix from renewables or decarbonized mm -hmm. or whatever. But as Ivan said, uh, the, society, the citizens and the politicians should be realistic because if we link that with the title of our debate, the energy costing nothing, uh, I'm not sure if that's feasible or it's going to be feasible ever. Yeah, so I, I have a, a, a somewhat different view. Um, I actually look at myself and I put the burden on my own shoulders to lead this industry to eliminate the use of fossil fuels for energy use. And I will tell you, um, I'm not an expert on plastics and things like that that also use fossil fuels. And I don't know mm -hmm. the realities of those other industries, but in the energy industry, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that given enough time and uh, intention that we can eliminate the use of fossil fuels for energy. And I fully respect that countries like Indonesia are going to need more time to accomplish that than uh, than a, a country like you know uh, Canada that already has you know a very large abundance of of hydropower and other renewable energies um, and has a shorter path uh, and is also a more prosperous country and you know I fully respect that we're going to move at different paces in different parts of the world but even in Indonesia you know a brand new coal-fired power plant that you installed yesterday is going to be um, uh, 38 years old in 2060 when Indonesia has committed to get to net zero. And so even, even Indonesia um, can retire their coal-fired power plants, even the ones that are brand new, and, and, and still get you know, an economic life out of them. And along the way, we can use biofuels instead of coal. We can we can use green ammonia instead of fuel. You know, they're mm -hmm. uh, in Japan. They're they're they just issued an RFP that came out from Jira um, that they're going to start coal firing with with green ammonia. So uh, so we we with the right intention and the right um, and and the and the right time period, we can we can get off of fossil fuels completely. And and I would also just say you know. In some of the things that look really difficult, like you know, long haul aviation, um, there are experiment there are, uh, work pro programs underway right now to create synthetic fuels using green hydrogen uh, for aviation fuels. So um, you know, I, I can tell you that in some industries it's going to happen more rapidly. I think uh, using green ammonia as a fuel for shipping is going to happen pretty quickly, more, more quickly than people realize. Um, and, you know, right now, you know, a lot of our, our uh, uh, long haul shipping, you know, container vessel uh, type uh, vessels, they're using, uh, you know, heavy fuel oil, which is, you know, just one of the dirtiest fossil fuels that we have on the planet. Um, those are the kind of places that we can rapidly start using ammonia, uh, green ammonia uh, as a replacement. So our company is just dedicated to this idea that, um, you know, this isn't going to happen unless people like us make it happen. And I'm, I'm fully dedicated to being one of the people that's going to, that's going to make this happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. If, 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 if I may, if I, if I may jump into the, uh, uh, into the conversation uh, from that point and thank you uh, Paul for mentioning uh, Indonesia uh, in this regards. Uh, so, I, and maybe this sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, trying to uh, uh, direct the discussion in which uh, to this uh, uh, to this point where uh, we are racing with time, right? 
uh, there is already a statistic, although I need to verify this further, uh, and but actually this is coming from the Indonesian government, that if we cannot achieve the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the, in, uh, by able to reduce the increase uh, of temperature below 1.5 degrees in 2030, uh, it said that in 2050, 52 million people will lose their home right, because of the flood uh, and because so many population live in the coastline. So actually, it is about understanding that the consequences of the climate change can affect uh, people's life, right? And but the, but the, the but the thing is, uh, each and, uh, we, we the the people uh, the, the public are not well uh, well aware of the risk uh, that might uh, happen when it comes uh, to if we are trying to leave this problem as what it is right now, right? Uh, so. Uh, I think the other, the other important uh, thing that needs to be done is how we can make sure that the people have knowledge, uh, the information uh, to empower, uh, to, to, so, so that they know the, the, the effects or the, uh, the, of, of the carbon emission or the carbon footprint that they make, right? And then, but, but then again, we also need to feed them with options uh, on, on how they can uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, make the wise decision for them to, to choose which path they would like to go. And especially, uh, this is something that needs to be, uh, of course, uh, given to the uh, politicians, uh, especially we're going to face the election again, cycle again in 2024. So uh, that's why we are working really hard to see how we can put this decarbonization issue to become mainstream as because it is not as mainstream as what we would like it to be now. So that's why um, I, I think that uh, we, we, we can have all the technology in the world to decarbonize and we can have all the money in the world to decarbonize. Uh, and, 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 and we are very thankful. Uh, for example, we have what it's called right now and maybe a ping up from oh, what Paul mentioned just now, but the uh, transitioning or retiring the coal fire power plant. We have this thing called the energy transitioning mechanism, right? But the devil is in the detail. <laughs> and, and sorry to say, but sometimes uh, coming from a developing country, Bregon, how to address these really number crunching details it is something that we need to do it more faster. Right, and this is something that uh, we need uh, the support from all stakeholders to make sure that this kind of you know solution can be effectively being uh, you know uh, put into the re uh, regulation, uh, and everyone knows what they need to do and everything, and we can bring all the necessary resources, uh, either, either the financing, the technology, so that we can quickly make these changes because uh, and, uh, we we are racing with time again. So I, I cannot really emphasize this further. So I, I just hope that, you know, uh, the, the, this becoming something that uh, we can really uh, see at this, uh, hopefully becoming mainstream over the time uh, and visuals how we can actually empower uh, the important stakeholders, the public and also the politician out there. That's great. Thanks, Ivan. I think, um, Paul, you made the comment. Yeah. I, I've shared, oh, yeah. yes, we found him. I you yes, you. Welcome. I'm very sorry. No, no. Can you hear no. me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I went yes. back to my office in the meantime. Uh, there was some problem with the computer of my employee. So VPN was fighting with uh, Google uh, Chrome. <laughs> ah. But it's nice to participate in this meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, apologies. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, in any case, I learned that vision without action is a daydream. And actions speak louder than words. And that's one uh, my, my Chinese partners of the International Trade and Investment Center often tell me, talk does not cook rice. <laughs> <laughs> Could not However, <laughs> action without vision, action without vision is a nightmare. Look at what's happening today. So policymakers and we ourselves, we need a vision, but also a balanced action. I think that's that's very important. That's one of my takeaways of uh, today's uh, meetings. Right. Uh, Laura, Laura, yeah, Laura. you know, uh, I think our I think our moderator is frozen. Uh, <laughs> but just, just oh, no, no. Yeah. I, so I think if 
I give my mic. Uh, I think, can you guys hear me? I think there's an issue. I think Jan is on my account in oh. and, speak. Uh, and so yeah. i am in two places at We're once each other. <laughs> so uh we learned something about the software today but thank you uh, but i will hand the back the mic back to you jan so you can continue to join the discussion um because i i think it's important um we mentioned paul mentioned the idea that uh, fossil fuels still have a role to play in plastics but not in the energy sector which i think is i want to add uh, there's a company in Wyoming in the United States called Ramaco, and their motto is coal is too valuable to burn, which I just think is the right way to think about fossil fuels because they do play a role in so many things that we don't recognize and finding ways and really rethinking. I think that's what the energy transition is going to be about is really starting to understand this ecosystem of technology and raw materials and products and understanding how it fits into um, a new environment that we want to create with these, these products. Um, our, our time together is so short. I want to skip to our last question, and, uh, one of our last questions, and talk about this idea, Ivan, that you brought up in terms of how important it is to help people have knowledge and to empower them to make good decisions and what options are available to really think about how to decarbonize the energy system. And I'd like to hear from each of our panelists around what do you think, um, what myth or bit of misinformation do you think is the most important thing to, for people to know? Where would you start with that education um, to begin to have a, a more meaningful conversation that is, as Jan said, vision that has action attached to it as well? May I start? Please, Jose, <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm going to be quite straightforward. Uh, and it's in the opposite direction of the title of our, our debate. I would like to educate people that having a more sustainable, more sustainable electricity, probably it's going to cost us more. So things are going to be more expensive. Because if you have, for example, in India, an aluminium plant uh, powered by a huge coal fire power plant, and you substitute, you replace that coal fire power plant for other kind of electricity, uh, and uh, for example, Ivan, I think it, I'm not sure if it, if it was Ivan or Paul said, uh, for example, that we need to fund biomass plants to make yeah, them yeah, yeah. Uh, feasible for investors. Well, those subsidies mm -hmm. are going to be paid by someone through taxes, through the electricity, th however. But the fact that we want more sustainable electricity is not going to cost nothing. It's going to cost more. And if you look at the example in Europe, uh, we have uh, CO2 taxes. The, the cost of the gas, even before the Ukraine problem, um, the cost of the gas was increasing and so on. And now the cost of the wholesale market of the megawatt hour is double, one, double from one year ago. So being sustainable is going to be fantastic, but it's going to cost us more. So that I would like to educate the people. Uh, uh, the first thing I would like to educate the people about. Thanks, Jose. Okay, uh, I think I'll go next. Great. You know, Jose, again, uh, you know, respectfully, I have a different view on things. <laughs> um, you, you know, it's really important. I, I've been innovating in energy uh, my whole career, over 30 years. And um, it's really important when you're an innovator to be looking forward and not looking backwards. So just for example, 15 years ago, people were looking at wind power. And if you were looking backwards, they were the wind turbines were unreliable. They were expensive. Um, and, but if you were looking forward 15 years ago, you could see that uh, big companies were coming in like General Electric and others that were gonna be able to deal with the unreliability, uh, you know, I mean, mechanical unreliability and um, that as the, as the turbines got larger, more efficient, and as the industry scaled, that the pricing was gonna be coming down. 
And so if you're looking forward right now, um, if, well, if you look backwards, re renewables look expensive. If you're looking forward, they're the cheapest form of, of energy right now. Now, what they're not the cheapest form of is capacity. And I, and I, I just want to acknowledge right now, fossil fuels are a cheaper form of capacity. And just, you know, in, in short order, energy is, is um, in, in the power sector, things that create energy are very low cost. They run all the time. And uh, what, what creates capacity are the things that, you know, on, on a bad day in the power grid, when you just have to have electricity, those things that are there on the worst day, that those are the capacity kind of things. And those things tend to be more expensive, have low capacity factors, et cetera. Um, and right now, fossil fuels are the lower cost form of capacity, but that's going to change too. Um, as we start producing, as I said earlier, uh, more and more uh, fuels that come that are made from renewable power, uh, they're going to get, again, if you're looking backwards, they look expensive right now. If, you're, if you look forward, the cost of these um, renewable fuels is going to be dropping, dropping dramatically, and there would be a cheaper form of capacity. And again, once they get built, they have zero variable cost, essentially zero. And if you're a fossil fuel uh, form of capacity, you're going to get pushed out of the capacity market as well because you're going to have all this zero variable cost uh, capacity available. This is just a really important for investors for, you know, and, and then the, the other thing in terms of what's the myth that people don't realize you know, a lot. One of the things in looking backwards at renewables um, is they, they've been about you know a, a few percent of total human energy consumption is is met by renewable power, and that's been true for a long time. Well, the reason for that is that renewables growth has been driven predominantly by hydropower, and hydropower is growing at about the same rate as global energy demand, and so it never catches up. Um, you, you get more and more hydro, but it never catches up with the growth in global demand. Wind and solar are growing dramatically faster than hydro ever did. And if you extrapolate their growth forward, um, it's like 2040 when you when renewable power is actually enough to meet all of humanity's energy needs, not electricity, energy. This is we're about to enter a, a, a time of change in the in the energy sector that is is no it's gonna happen faster than people realize. The costs are gonna drop quicker than people realize. Uh, that's why I jumped in with both feet to a, a green hydrogen company. Let me tell you, we're, it, <laughs> there's there's things that are about to happen that are gonna be just in, in crazy. And, and you know, the, maybe the last thing I'll say to give other speakers time, uh, you know, our, our goal is to make green hydrogen the world's largest globally traded commodity. Uh, today, the world's largest globally traded commodity is oil. Number four is LNG, coal is somewhere on the top 20. Um, our goal is to displace all of that and make green hydrogen the world's largest globally traded commodity. Um, and, and again, this isn't 20, 2100. This is more like, you know, over the next two decades. A a Thanks. Amen I to that. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you know, it's really, it's interesting, um, Paul, we won't have time, but on our next session, we can talk about the role of uh, nuclear energy in producing hydrogen for that carbon-free economy, because I know that that's a, a hot topic in other circles. And, but I just throw that out there for fun. Uh, in the meantime, I see Jan has joined us again. So I want yeah. to share Mike and then Ivan will get your um, comments on the myths you'd like to bust as well. Sure. Well, I completely agree with Paul. And, uh, you know, we have a small country called the Netherlands. Uh, you know, I can see windmills out of my window, as I told you yesterday. Windmills, solar, everybody has solar panels on uh, the house. Uh, we have really a, a lot of investment in electric cars. We are actually, the Netherlands is one of the leading electric transport players at this point in time. In 2030, nobody is driving a car with fossil anymore. It's all electric. So that, this, is, this is just an example, but God say, it takes a lot of incentives, financial incentives, because it's driven by tax incentives, subsidies, partly, but that's short term. In the long term, renewable energy is not more expensive than fossil fuel. 
when you factor in the life cost um, factors and, and uh, the, the life cycle cost in general, if you calculate well, according to also advisors of the minister here, uh, if you factor in life cycle cost, then it's uh, not going to be more expensive. But I, I, I want to make one more uh, point. You know, we talk about energy, but more than ever, we need to connect the dots between climate, energy, poverty, energy, food and water. These issues cannot be addressed in isolation. That is very important because it's very nice to speak as a European, uh, an American, but look what's happening in India or no, Indonesia, for instance. We have to take care, we have to integrate these factors, I think. And, you know, talking about energy, and everybody knows the energy of the mind is the essence of life. And the future is green energy, sustainability and renewable energy. And hydrogen is going to be very important. And we, you know, this is going to be the focus for many, well, so many Western European countries, I think. But look at what Toyota has been doing with hydrogen and Lighthouse. It's all going to happen. And that's maybe the long term. But now, at this point in time, it's wind, solar and we have to have a discussion about nuclear power. It's a young technology and, you know, there's much to be discovered, I think. And it's very strange to talk about nuclear power now, uh, today. Uh, but I think it's going to be very important to, uh, yeah, uh, to uh, investigate the problems. But also, we know that there are so many innovative people who are going to be able to come up with solutions and bring this technology to its full potential next to, you know, solar, wind, biomass. And uh, I think that that's going to be crucial. So, uh, but I really think the future is green energy, sustainability, renewable energy, not so much for us, but for our children and our grandchildren. Great, thank you, Jan. Ivan, in the few minutes, just the couple minutes we have left, um, would you like to share your uh, your myth that you'd like to bust? Yes, one myth that I would like to bust is that uh, uh, clean energy is expensive. I, I, well, it can be cheap, but there is a process that needs to be followed through so that we can achieve that, right? And this is something that, that this sometimes is something that is really still less understood, especially by our, our politician. You know, they just want to have instant, quick solution to solve problems, mm -hmm. but it, it cannot go into that particular way. So that's why, in order for make the energy, the the clean energy to become affordable, then we need scale, right? But if you and 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 the other thing is that we need to make sure that the technology cost can be drawn down. So that's why uh, I, I think it's really important to see how we able to know uh, what kind of resources that we need to pull so that we can actually make the technology cost to become more affordable. And, and as, uh, I would like to echo what uh, Jose actually just said, that we can actually drive the public uh, money uh, or maybe from the utility that they pay, like what is happening in Japan. You know, They actually pay like, what, 2% or 5% of what they pay monthly uh, so that they can actually uh, uh, spend some money for... Uh, you know, making this uh, transition by making the feed-in tariff to becoming affordable uh, for the investors and all that. So uh, we can make the, uh, air clean energy cheap, but we need to have a process that we need to follow through. And this is something that needs to be understood by the public and also by the politicians. So that's uh, the myth that yeah. I would like to pass and also the, uh, you know, things that we need to go through. That's great. We are almost, I think we are out of time. And I, I want to thank our speakers um, for the remarks today. I, I've, it's great that we were able to cover all the topics. Um, we, we talked about equity and the international aspects of energy and the sort of different expectations in different parts of the world. Um, this balance between cost and quality is 
one, it's going to be a debate that goes on in this sector for a long time. But I think that in these last remarks that you've made, this idea of innovation and what we could do with carbon capture, sequestration or fusion or geothermal or more better wind and solar, how we get there with all of the transition, that innovation, that conversation is really going to be uh, uh, an exercise in professionals like ourselves in managing expectations and helping people set the bar where we can achieve goals and keep moving forward. Because I think that there is, as we've discussed, many things that distract people um, and kind of set us down some policy rabbit holes that we end up not being able to achieve what we want as quickly as we need to. So this is a great, important conversation. I'm sorry we were able to scratch the surface. Um, thank you, everyone, Jan in particular, for dealing with no, the you. Uh, technical thank you so much. issues. I'm glad we were able to get you on, on the screen. Laura, thank you very much for your solution. And thank let you. us uh, be connected. Because Absolutely, it's an yes. important yes. topic. Yes. Yes, it is yeah. a very important yes. topic. Let's yeah. be connected and uh, let's have more discussions. We can do Great. this. Great. Well, yeah? and actually, okay. if you guys are open to the idea, I took some notes and this weekend I would like to maybe put them down into an outline and maybe we can we can publish an article somewhere. We can send it through the Horasis blog yeah. or do something that captures Excellent. the essence of our conversation. Let's do so. We will work okay. on this. Yeah, yeah. We will okay. Why not? Why not? Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Get some sleep, Thanks. Yes, yes. Bye -bye. I'll take some sleep. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.